Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelko. I have the good fortune of being a senior advisor here to the Wilson Center in our global sustainability and resilience program, our environmental change and security program, and most importantly for today's function, uh, working with our HELPS program, Health, Environment, Livelihoods, Population Security Project, uh, a um, five-year program that is supported by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health, and one that really brings together the issues that um, we are talking about today and that Ken Weiss from the LA Times has captured in his really, truly amazing five-part series in the Los Angeles Times. We've um, entitled today's session, playing off the, the themes and the um, way that Ken has constructed his series, Beyond Seven Billion, Reporting on Population, Environment, and Security. And to say that, um, this today and having Ken here in Washington at the Wilson Center was many years in the making is, is both true and to some degree an understatement. Um, I met Ken in Barcelona actually, which if, is not a bad place to meet somebody. Um, but Wilson Center and Population Reference Bureau uh, were collaborating on a, on a panel as part of the World Conservation Congress and gotten an email from this LA Times reporter who wanted to talk about the intersection of population and environment and security. And, I wish that was a common occurrence that we got an email from a, a, a major newspaper doing it. Fortunately, it's more common than it was then. Um, but this was really exciting for a lot of us. And um, it, it really continued to be exciting when it wasn't the one-off that I'm sure many of you um, have the experience of, of, of having with journalists. And in fact, the journalists by definition are forced to have because they are asked to cover so many things and not have the time to dig deep on complex topics, not have the time to have really top flight photographers and videographers to work with him or her to help tell these really complex stories from all over the world. And this is something that um, Ken has been able to do. And so it's a real privilege uh, for us to both read his words, see the images, and hear from him today. Ken is um, uh, an avowed uh, I don't know if we call him a surfer dude, but at least a surfer. Uh, and um, that, that love of the ocean and getting on and under uh, uh, the sea is one that um, he brought into his professional life. You probably uh, see if you read the bio, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner for his series on the oceans in LA Times, which as we'll discuss today, because I hope we will delve into some of the, not just the substance of the links, but how we find ways for in journalism today for these issues to get covered because unfortunately uh, Ken's, the, the amount of reporting, the resources that he was able to garner to do this reporting is exception rather than the rule and we have some, um, some notable prominent takes on population issues. It's great to see Rob and Dennis from National Geographic here a couple years ago. We know that they spent a whole year with a series of meetings on that. Uh, but th these, these series don't come around uh, that often and therefore it's terrific that we can discuss it, both the details of what was covered, but also how it got covered and how we can find ways to talk about these complex intersections between population, environment, um, and security. As I said, Ken is, is a journalist, a reporter at the LA Times, uh, has been covering these environmental issues for many, many uh, years, a couple decades plus and um, uh, we had the good fortune on this series to talk, to talk with him throughout. In addition to the, the Pulitzer, he's also won the George Polk Award and in journalism, really the top flight awards for his reporting. Um, we're also very pleased to have Todd, Tom Hudley, who is a senior editor at the Pulitzer Center in Crisis Reporting. And uh, this, is, um, this is terrific because really the Pulitzer Center is one of the places that has adapted to this new world and the challenges of getting these issues covered and finding ways to get stories done and working with journalists and working with the outlets to have um, high quality journalism on tough and complicated issues from hard to get places, hard to get to places. Um, and so Tom is going to share not just the insights of his uh, literally three plus decades of being a foreign correspondent covering wars and um, some, again, tough issues to cover, uh, but also serving as editor and trying to um, operate in this world that makes it so difficult to cover these uh, tremendously 
important stories. Longtime reporter for the Chicago Tribune and someone uh, who really brings a very valuable perspective to this discussion. I'll just uh, conclude before introducing Ken to just say a word about where we're sitting. Uh, I, I see many familiar faces and so you will know that I have to say that the Wilson Center is the living memorial to President Wilson and while it's uh, a number of you have heard that before, I think it is a special place that tries to reflect his legacy as scholar and as politician bringing these two worlds together on a nonpartisan, non-advocacy basis. And we, in the Environmental Change and Security Program and now the uh, Global Sustainability and Resilience Program, been tackling these issues since 1994, bringing these different communities together that don't often have a place to talk. Um, so we hope you will keep coming back, pick up the materials outside, uh, check out our work on New Security Beat blog, uh, and then in take advantage of the webcast. We're webcasting live today, so when we come to the Q&A, we'll need you to use a mic so the folks online can hear it. Uh, but it also means that today's session will be uh, video archived so that you can share that URL with others so that they can benefit from uh, hearing uh, Ken and, and Tom's words as well. So Ken, I want to turn the floor over to you and we can get the program underway. Thanks, uh, thanks Jeff. Um, before I get started, um, I actually want to give a special thanks to uh, Jeff DeBalco and Megan Parker and all the, their colleagues at the Wilson Center for helping me during this endeavor. Um, they put me in touch with a lot of very smart people uh, who helped guide me along the way. And I have to say, on a personal note, I was stunned when Jeff um, uh, uh, made his announcement that he's moving on and has moved on to a university in Ohio. Uh, I mean, how do you replace a guy like this? Uh, to me, he's synonymous with the environmental and secure, uh, excuse me, environmental change and security program. But also through Jeff, I have learned that the world is a big place and it's got a lot of, uh, a lot of people. And so if Jeff is one in a million, right, that means there's 7,044 people just like him. <laughs> and that is kind of one of the points. It's hard for me to get my mind around so many zeros um, after seven billion. Um, but uh, let's try. It's, uh, um, and since Jeff called me out as a surfer boy, um, and a diver. Let me explain how I ended up doing this, and there's always a connection to the ocean. A few years ago, I was invited to join a panel of journalists who um, addressed uh, a conference of about 3,000 coral reef scientists. They get together every three years to sort of uh, discuss coral reefs and, uh, and how they're suffering from too much fishing pressure and too much pollution pouring off the land and uh, seawater getting dangerously hot and acidic. Um, and everything um, that they have spent their careers studying uh, is either being cooked, killed, or covered with slime. Um, and uh, at, at one point, a rather droll British journalist uh, asked, well, why don't you ever address population growth? Uh, it's a common thread to all these stressors, he, he, he said. And the convention uh, center fell silent. And finally, someone in the back of the room shouted, we can't, it's not our department. And people get nervous when talking uh, publicly about population growth, and it's understandable. Biologists and ecologists would rather avoid it. You know, why pick a fight, they tell me, you know, and when there's so many other things that they could spend their time doing. And uh, many environmental groups won't touch it either. Um, th they fear backlash, they fear bringing on new enemies, you know, and as a result, population growth seems to get far less attention than it does, did in the late 60s when there were half as many of us. So how I ended up writing about, th wh so why did I end up writing about this and why should I invite such trouble? Well, after uh, spending more than a decade chronicling sort of the disappearance of wildlife and the stress on nature and altered oceans, um, I, uh, I started talking more, I'm thinking more broadly about our circumstances and I've spent a lot of time uh, uh, with Old, older biologists um, who pointed out to me it's not just our raising, uh, rising levels of consumption, but also the number of consumers that are involved. And so I thought for a long time that some journalist somewhere, uh, uh, you know, someone without any preconceived notions, uh, an honest broker, if you will, without an agenda or baggage, needed to take a hard look at population growth. 
and no one seemed to be volunteering. Um, so when an editor started pressing me and doing another multi-part series, I thought, you know, what the hell? Now, I knew very little about this topic. Um, and I was too young to have read The Population Bomb when it came out. And so, like a lot of people, I had this sort of general vague notion of what this was all about. But it was sort of shrouded in this fog of uncertainty. Um, uh, I wasn't reading much about it except for what I see as sort of a seemingly endless series of essays, mostly in conservative publications, about how Malthus and his followers are wrong. And I could never figure out what's this preoccupation with this guy who's been dead for 180 years. Um, and as a journalist, I was sort of attracted to the smoke here, but I was wondering, is there a fire, you know? And, and uh, is population growth an issue or not? Is it happening? Is it real? You know, and whose department is it anyway? The, the journey took a lot longer than I expected, and it took me to places I never planned to go, uh, to the slums of Nairobi and Mumbai and to, and to the homes of people who live in trash dumps in Manila, you know, and even the prisons in Afghanistan. And I went out, out asking questions. And soon my notebook was filled um, with stories from these people. Uh, these aren't my stories, they're really their stories, and I'm gonna share uh, a few with them uh, in a moment. Um, I came at this topic from a perspective, as Jeff said, as an environmental reporter, but I found myself drawn into uh, new and surprising directions. And it isn't just a question of can we live within our means on this planet, or for how long, but how can we feed the bottom billion, the poorest billion of us who go to bed hungry you know, most nights, or deal with the hundreds of millions of children you know, who are undernourished, so undernourished that their brains and bodies um, never really live up to their full potential. You know, or the angry and young, frustrated men who, uh, uh, who were born into fast-growing and often unstable countries um, where they can't get jobs and thus can't get married and get stuck between childhood and adulthood. And these are the same guys who seem to be easily exploited by radical clerics and other leaders to strike back at Western influences and given our, our tendency in the United States to be um, a serial interventionist, you know, we're often a convenient target um, for their frustration and rage. So I had to figure out, um, I, I also as I started looking at this, I started realizing that there's actually a key to almost all of these issues. And it was something I never expected, um, and it was something I'll tell you about in a, in a bit. But first, as I got started, I found myself in a familiar situation when you start looking at something new. Um, you start digging in, you take a hard look, and you find more questions than answers. And that's certainly been the case here. Um, and I'm going to show you a five-minute intro video that we put on our online package for the project to give you a sense. We're facing one of the biggest train wrecks in human civilization. How are we going to feed 9 billion people without trashing the planet at the same time? This idea of thinking about population isn't driven by a single number. How many people the Earth can support depends on natural constraints which we do not fully understand and human choices which we have not yet made. We only have so many resources in this world. There are not infinite amounts of resource. We live in a world today where nearly a billion people will go to bed hungry tonight. We've got 85 million more births and deaths every year on this planet. Big part of the story for reducing birth rates is investing in children, saving those children's lives, and creating an expectation that yes, your children will have the chance to lead 
a healthy and productive life. To have a population that the earth can sustain, we need to look both at the population numbers and how much people consume. You can't take one without the other. We currently consume resources on planet earth as if the earth were about 50% more productive than it actually is. We've literally farmed a planet and now we have to double that. And we don't have any frontiers left to discover. We have a propensity to use up all available resources. And we're doing that with greater success than any other species on the planet. We've got to figure out how to use resources more sustainably now so that they still exist. It's our future. It's the young people's future. You know that we are compromising so dramatically by our inability to address what are absolutely addressable problems. That uh, video was put together by my colleague Rick Loomis and Liz Balian and others. And uh, Rick is a terrific photojournalist, and I was really lucky to have him along for the ride. Unlike me, he's compact. He needs very little sleep. He can live for days on peanut M&Ms and co warm Coca-Cola. And that turns out to be very useful in places like the camps in the Dob, where there's nothing to eat but but maybe a three-day-old goat intestine stew that's sit, been sitting out too long. Nearly all the photos um, that you see here are his, um, as well as the video footage. It's just the two of us. Um, when I first approached this topic, um, I found myself uh, more confused than usual. I went up to Stanford to talk to Paul Ehrlich, and you can guess what uh, Ehrlich told me. He's the co-author of The Population Bomb with his wife Anne and 40 other books that don't get much attention um, since his first one. And, um, and uh, you know, and he was basically concerned that there were too many of us and we're growing too fast for a finite planet. But then I, at the, on, the, on the Stanford campus, I also went to a three-day conference on aging societies. And it offered a parade of economists um, that uh, were warning that we're a graying society, um, that, um, that there's not gonna, we're gonna be heavily weighted with too many oldsters and we wouldn't have enough young people to take care of us in our old age or prop up social security. Um, and the research that these economists do uh, gets cited uh, by those who run uh, with arguments in, the, um, you know, in, a, in a very different direction. Um, it's not that our numbers are too many, that they believe that our numbers are too few. Uh, they warn of the empty cradle, the birth dearth, um, they've got a post-apocalyptic message of their own. It's sort of a cold, desolate existence with shrinking customer base, tax base, um, 
and people are honestly worried about this. Um, uh, and conservatives write about this all the time to promote the sort of primacy of growth, as do those who are devoted their lives to battling abortion or preaching the gospel of life. And my mind sort of seized up. Um, you know, you know, will there be too few of us or too many? You know, is the future going to be a cold, lonely, deserted place, or will it be hot, flat, and crowded? Um, as a dogged reporter, rather dogged reporter, um, I went on the prowl and found the smartest demographers I could uh, who could help me sort out the basic facts. And some are tucked into various departments in universities, unusual departments that you'd never guess. But more often you find them at places like the United Nations, the US Census Bureau, the Population Council in New York, um, IASA in, in Australia, uh, excuse me, Austria, or the Population Reference Bureau right here in DC. And I'm gonna show you a brief explanatory video that we also produced and put on our website to help readers sort of get an idea of the long-term trends. The number of people on Earth has soared exponentially in recent decades a trend that will continue into the next century, according to United Nations demographers. For most of human history, the population grew very slowly. Short lifespans and high child mortality offset high birth rates. Population edged higher with improvements in agriculture and higher still when the Industrial Revolution improved urban living standards. Humanity hit the one billion mark around 1810. From there, the numbers began a steep ascent. Sanitation improved. Food supplies became more reliable. Vaccines and other medical advances helped people live longer. The population doubled to two billion by 1930. It doubled again by 1974. Last year, the global population passed seven billion. It took just a dozen years to add the last billion. By 2050, experts say the world will have 9.3 billion people, the equivalent to add in another India and China, the two most populous countries. Most of the growth will occur in places least able to handle it, developing nations where hunger, political instability and environmental degradation are already pervasive. The continent of Africa is expected to double in population by the middle of the century, adding one billion people. So I found there was a clear consensus among uh, top demographers in which uh, direction we're going. Uh, but I, what I couldn't understand is why their uh, arithmetic, essentially, um, wasn't persuading skeptics. And it was because there was a powerful counter-narrative. Um, Birth rates are falling, and thus any projections that these made, um, you know, from these pointy-headed, number-obsessed demographers have got to be wrong. Um, and indeed, birth rates have been falling. Um, they were about five, an average of five children per woman in back in the mid-60s, and they're about half that today. Um, uh, uh, and uh, even thoughtful publications like The Economist tend to run graphics like this, leaving the impression that we're on a very steep slide. But all this actually raised a very good question that I needed to answer, and, and that was, how is it that fertility could be falling and our numbers are going up? And so I went back to the demographer, my demographer guides and learned about something called population momentum. And I'm going to show just another very short graphic here. There are more people on Earth today than ever before. Even as global birth rates fall, population will continue to soar for many years. This is an example of what demographers call population momentum. Momentum builds when there are large numbers of young people in their childbearing years. So many are having children that even a modest birth rate makes for a big population increase. This often happens in poor nations least able to handle the growth. The UN projects that there will be at least 2 billion more people by mid-century. Fertility and longer lifespans account for some of that growth, but a large portion will come from the momentum created by hundreds of millions of young people starting families. This is the largest generation in history. And it seems like population momentum has been lost in the public discourse on this. And um, uh, uh, it's, um, 
you know, it's, I think it's important, and it's why uh, many countries continue to grow after they hit what demographers call replacement fertility, and that's usually defined as a slightly more than two children per woman. That's when parents essentially replicate themselves, and over time, the population will stabili stabilize. I see China always as the best example that despite um, more than three decades of aggressive, even brutal enforcement of its one-child policy, it's, it continues to grow. China will add another 42 million people by the UN's latest calculations before it peaks at about 1.4 million in, uh, in about a dozen years from now. And then it will slowly start to drift down. And that's with a very low birth rate of about one, the best estimate is 1.6 children per woman. So looking at, um, but uh, looking at the world as a whole, I learned that we're growing, but at vastly different rates. Um, and um, if you combine, um, if you combine the, the populations of all the wealthy countries, that'd be the US, the countries in Europe, Australia, Korea, Japan, this sort of thing, the developed world, we're growing, but only modestly. And it's a very different story um, in the developing world where 97% of the growth will happen between yeah. now and mid-century. Um, and uh, we're at a very critical junction, uh, juncture in history. Uh, nearly half the world's 7 billion inhabitants are 25 years or younger. 1.2 billion of them are adolescents just coming into their uh, reproductive years. And the decisions made by this generation, the largest in history, will determine whether we had, as the video said, uh, 9.3 billion, um, which is the, the best estimate of the UN, um, or we're going to hit, go to 11 billion, which would be the equivalent of adding three Chinas. So this notion of a demographic winter doesn't hold up. Um, uh, uh, there are a few countries, Russia, for instance, which has seen a decline. It peaked at about 148 million, and it's, it's dropped about 6 uh, million people in the last 15 years. Um, but it's not true in the United States, um, where that message gets repeated over and over again. We're the only industrialized nation that's uh, still growing at a pretty good clip, we're at 312 million and projected to hit, I think, 423 million. Um, by mid-century, that's another 110 million people. And people ask me all the time, um, why didn't I include US growth in the series? Um, and it's largely because it's an immigration policy story. It's a different story. It's one that we have uh, written about extensively at the LA Times. This is a, a picture from our rooftop of an immigration rally. Um, and what, for uh, this series, what I really wanted to look at was the causes and consequences of growth in the developing world, um, where 97% of it's going to come. Um, and it tends to be in places like South Asia and Africa. So if you note on this chart here that Nigeria is uh, in the seventh place um, on the top 10 list, the Population Reference Bureau estimates that it will eclipse us by 2050 um, uh, as the third most populous nation. Um, and the reason is higher birth rates, of course, uh, young population, but something else, that, that contraceptive use is much lower. Here in the United States, married women or those in, in, uh, in uh, committed relationships, about 72% are using contraception. In Nigeria, it's 10%. So I wanted to share a couple of stories with you, and let's start with India. It's big, as you can see on this chart, and it's going to get bigger. And, uh, and it'll be the world's most populous country in about a decade. And that's when the United Nations project it will surpass China. And women in India, on average, uh, have about two and a half children per woman. That's a half a child above the, the, the replacement fertility, which is the first step towards stabilizing the population. And it also has hundreds of millions of young couples in their prime childbearing years. And now India's prime minister, um, he says that this gives India uh, uh, a younger workforce and a competitive edge over China on the global market. But what he doesn't really talk about as much is that, um, that almost all of this growth is in the poorest northern states, um, such as Uttar Pradesh and Bihar and Rajasthan. And education is very low, and poverty and hunger is so extensive that there are millions of children who are literally uh, so undernourished, they're stunted, meaning that neither their bodies nor their minds um, will really reach the full potential. Um, and, um, you know, and we saw some efforts to sort of counteract that, and the scale is, a is just astounding. So Care India, just one NGO, for instance, uh, has midday feeding programs like this one in 34,000 villages. Um, and that sounds like a lot until you realize that, that Uttar Pradesh has 200 million people in it. If it was a country, it would be the fifth largest, uh, just 
just beating out Brazil. So educators and health officials say they can't build schools fast enough, medical clinics, uh, you know, the but their leaders sort of reap a political dividend and it brings on an ambivalence that the greater the population in Uttar Pradesh means more seats uh, uh, for these representatives will have in parliament. So against this backdrop, I just want to get into one of my first story about Ramji and Mumta. Um, they were a young couple that we met. Um, they were married at age 10 and 11. They had their first child when they were 13. The second, by the time they were 15, that's when we caught up with them. Um, and this was not, uh, just didn't meet their parents' uh, approval, but it was actually actively encouraged. That Ramji's primary duty um, as the eldest boy in the family was to produce a son, an heir, who has important religious duties um, uh, of lighting a funeral pyre, uh, ensuring a way to heaven. Um, and as for Mamta, um, you know, as is, uh, is very true in India, and we're going to see more on this later, she sort of knows her place. Um, she does most of the work um, and really doesn't have much of a say. Um, I found that Ramji is an interesting sort of new face of India. He's a striver. Um, he wants to make a better life for he and his family. And he was ready to divert from, the, from tradition, from the path of his parents who had seven children. You know, and he thought it was a mistake for him to get married so early. It was a mistake to start having children so early. He had to give up school, his dreams of get, going to university and getting a good paying job. And so when he reached the age of 16 um, and finally could grow a mustache, um, you know, he took a stand. He, um, he wanted to stop a childr two children and he announced this to his parents. And that horrified his mother and his grandmother. And as she put it, um, and grandmother put it, having one son is like having one eye, and you need two eyes. So imagine yourself at age 16, standing up to your parents, your grandparents, your culture, tradition, you know, and even bumping up against um, a political ambivalence that makes the availability of contraceptives um, pretty uh, very spotty in rural India. And I found that the demand um, uh, seemed insatiable. Uh, we went to an IUD clinic at a medical facility um, uh, in rural Uttar Pradesh that was set up by, um, uh, by a group called World Health Partners and the fellow by, uh, who runs it, Gopi Gopalakrishnan. And Gopi uh, had, uh, and his organization had bust in a female paramedic with the skills to insert um, very low cost IUDs um, and it was uh, a mob scene. Uh, women with two, three, four children lined the halls. They sat on the roof. Um, they spilled out into the, into the, um, into the street, all eager uh, to get an IUD. And it was set up like an assembly line. It was pretty amazing. Um, you know, quick pregnancy test, slip behind the curtain, hike up the sari, you know, get it inserted. But there was no way that this female paramedic could handle 117 women this day. Um, with, uh, after a lot of negotiation, uh, she agreed she'd stay, spend the night and, and resume in the morning, and these women were uh, told to come back the next day. And Gopi, who's been doing this for the last 30 years, he, I mean, he had a story he told me about uh, setting up a tent camp in, uh, in uh, Bihar, in a remote area, and it was to offer sterilization of, for women in, the, in this area. They brought in doctors, nurses, all the medical facilities to handle about 200 cases. When 2,000 women showed up and they realized they weren't all going to um, get sterilized, they grew enraged and they broke up the furniture, ripped down the tents, and chased the doctors away. And he says that this has been his experience, that there is just a, an, uh, a desperate need um, in India. So all of these forces will determine when India hits replacement fertility, whether it'll hit in the next decade, as the UN projects, or whether and, and peak at about 1.7 billion people, or if it's going to take an extra decade or two, and then India could very well uh, reach two billion people or higher. So we also um, we spent some time, as I mentioned earlier, inside um, the largest complex of refugee camps in the world in Dadaab, Kenya. Now, most of these refugees come from Somalia. They fled sectarian violence and drought and wandered out of the desert, emaciated and exhausted. Um, and particularly the kids. And it's, it's sort of concentrated misery. Um, and one day we were to touring the hospital stabilization center 
And that's the place where they try to nurse emaciated kids back to health. And they start with this weak formula of milk and then end up um, giving them uh, this, uh, this uh, sort of peanut, uh, peanut butter stuff called plumpy nut that's fortified with vitamins and things. And we were following this doctor around on her rounds and uh, she gets waved over to the bed of this little boy, uh, Saad. And he was brought in a couple of days earlier. Um, he was unconscious and convulsing. And uh, we watched him, he was sort of labored in his breathing. And, um, and then he just uh, lit out this sort of final gasp and went quiet. And the doctor sprang into action um, uh, and she started pumping on his chest. She used an ambu bag respirator to try to fill his lungs and she worked away for quite a while. The aunt who was with him kept trying to pour water in his mouth. She didn't really know what was going on. The mother was not there. She was uh, back in the tent with her other seven children. Um, and uh, finally, the doctor realized that the boy's um, eyes were no longer dilating, and, and so she, she stopped and gently pulled the, the tubes off out of his mouth and the IV off his arm and, and, and excused herself and went into a corner and, and wept. Um, and I have to say, it was one of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life. Um, he was a two and a half year old boy. He weighed 18 pounds, um, and that's about half the weight of a healthy child. Um, and when the doctor returned, I started asking questions like, what, what's going on here? And, and she explained that the pneumonia was simply a symptom of a larger problem, that he was severely malnourished, something called, she called kwashiorkor. I'd never heard that word. Um, and I made her spell it. Twice, and um, you know, and uh, later, and, and she started. I, I started asking more questions, and I find out that this is a protein deficiency, and learned later that it's a medical term that actually comes from the Ga language in Ghana, and uh, the, the, this African uh, term basically means uh, the malady that strikes the child that's pushed away, that's deposed from the breast by a younger sibling. Um, and, uh, you know, it's happened so often they actually have a, a name for it. Um, and medical science has adopted that. And what I found shocking is that it's still happening, um, along with overall caloric deficiency, and that um, hunger related pneumonia and diarrhea and other maladies actually kill more people than AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis combined. Um, and that the overall number of uh, undernourished remains shockingly high, you know, nearly a billion people and that a child dies every 12 seconds. I, I found this all just a little uh, hard to imagine that that's still happening here in 2012. And you hear about this idea of birth spacing, you know, how it saves lives, and it's out, you know, and I actually there's something to it. Um, and what I didn't really understand is it's usually the older child that suffers. Another astounding thing I found from that uh, scene was that the Somali women are, uh, surrounded the doctor when she was performing heroics, um, and they were moaning in protest, telling her, don't intervene, it's God's will. The mother will simply have another child. Um, and that's the same thing I heard from a, from a fellow named Yusuf. He was a 25-year-old youth leader at the camp, and he announced that he, when he, we were talking to him, and he announced he was gonna sire 70 children and his wife had produced three so far, and he told me that when she stops breeding, I will jump on another young lady. Um, and, and I asked him, what does he plan to feed, how does he plan to feed all these children? And he said the same thing. He said, he said, God knows what to put in their mouths. God will provide, they have teeth. He says, it's God's will. And I asked him if he discussed this with his wife, and he laughed at me, you know, as did this whole circle of youth leaders. And they said, you know, of course he doesn't bother discussing this with a woman. Uh, Somali women, on average, uh, have about six children. Um, that's a little higher than in Kenya, but not as high as Uganda. And I heard all this talk about about um, you know about out competing other tribes, um, uh, usually from from men, not from women. And in Uganda, we met with a guy named Haji Naduli, and he's a he's a local official um, who had gained some notoriety or some attention at least by giving away pigs and cows. Uh, and chickens to prizes to women who had extra children or they have twins. Um, um, and he was a, on a mission, essentially, to enlarge the ranks of his tribe in Luero that had been massacred um, during one of the extreme violent episodes in Uganda's history. 
Um, he actually found that his little prize scheme wasn't getting very good traction, so like any good campaign, he realized he had better chance going negative. Um, and so he got a lot of radio and TV time warning that these European contraception causes cancer. And he said, he's, when he told me, he said, we're winning, this, this is working. Um, Naduli also told me that his message is essentially the same as the Ugandan's president, uh, Yoweri Museveni, um, who says, uh, has said repeatedly that he thinks Uganda needs to be more like China and India if it wants to have global influence and power. And what that means to him is more people. And so when I was there, the family planning clinics felt like they were under siege. Uh, their supplies from overseas were being held hostage in uh, customs uh, warehouses at the airport. I think that's better now, um, but it was, it was a remarkable time. Um, and I've heard from some people, you know, kind of as an environmental reporter, uh, particularly those who are focused on climate change, uh, who argue that population growth in Africa doesn't really matter. Um, they point out that these, these people admit only a tiny fraction of the CO2 of those of us in wealthy nations. And okay, point taken. Um, it, but this idea that it doesn't matter, you know, I found that it actually does matter. Um, it m matters to uh, folks like Francesca, uh, Francesca Quignare, who uh, was willing to take a risk of beating from her husband to sneak off every three months and get a shot, a hormone shot of Depo-Provera. Um, and the reason she was doing it is that she was one of her husband's two wives. Uh, the other wife had six children, she had two. And he split the paycheck evenly between the two of them and she did the calculus and figured she would be better off if she just stuck with two children. Um, and so she would slip away from her, ba her thatched ref hut every, um, every few months. Um, um, and I also think that it matters to, to folks like, um, like, the, like Ada that I met in Southwest Uganda. Um, she has six children and She's tired. I mean, she looks tired. She and she said she just cannot dig a bigger garden to uh, to to feed more children. And then she wants to stop at six. And this is a, a home-based clinic um, that was set up um, by uh, uh, Dr. Gali uh, Gladys Kalima Zukusoka, who's a wildlife veter veterinarian. And uh, Dr. Gladys runs a program devoted to saving the la the world's last remaining. Um, uh, mountain gorillas, and she realized one of the important things that she could do was helping women in the surrounding area, which is a very fast-growing area, uh, plan their families. There's a lot of human pressure um, on these gorillas. Um, they pass diseases back and forth, particularly scabies and measles, and there's also just a tremendous amount of uh, um, a loss of habitat. You can see the park boundary here between B the Bwindi impenetrable forest and the subsistence farms that have grown up around it. So I think it actually matters to Dr. Gladys and her life work as well. Um, uh, in this series, we, um, um, we also did a story looking at the youth bulge hypothesis. How um, rapidly growing countries with vast ranks of restless young men can contribute to violence um, in unstable countries. And the core idea is not that these, uh, this uh, extra, this all these young men spark violence. You leave that to tr typical reasons, uh, ethnic or religious tensions, um, boundary disputes or whatever. But once the violence gets going, they provide the kindling. Um, and, uh, and Liz Leahy, I know, is here. And this is work that she's worked on with Rich Chinkata and others. And I think this is hard, probably hard to see, but the idea is, is that the younger countries are at the top of the scale here, and, um, uh, and they tilt younger, and that's also red dots, that's where uh, most of the, the conflicts seem to break out. Afghanistan is quite near the top. It's up there with Yemen and Somalia and Sudan and Uganda and the Palestinian territories. So I thought Afghanistan was actually probably our best bet to get into this idea given that we've got a pretty significant investment in blood and treasure in that country. And since the US-led in invasion in Afghanistan's population has increased from 23 million to 33 million. And the mean age there is right now, it's 16.6 years old. Um, think about what you, how you were acting when you were 16 and a half years old, compared to the mean age in the US is 37 years old. So strategists who work um, in uh, defense and intelligence agencies have long sought to figure out 
why so many young men join the Taliban, um, you know, or join other violent uh, movements for that matter. And there are many, many competing theories, and I looked into all of them, and demographers have their own, and it's one of, that they can call recruitment costs. It's sort of supply and demand. And it seems to make some intuitive sense to me um, that if you're trying to line up fighters or suicide bombers, that you probably have a much better chance of recruiting um, and filling out your ranks from idle young men on the, in the streets of Kandahar than if you went to the quad of some uh, college campus uh, and tried to pick up first year, first year students. So I wanted to go sort of ground truth this theory and um, talk to Taliban members um, and ask them, well, why did they join up? Um, now, it's kind of hard to um, interview active Taliban members without ending up a permanent guest or worse. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, have had um, problems with that from other, other newspapers. Um, so I did the best, nest, best thing. I went to uh, what I think of as a controlled environment. I went to uh, Pulicharki Prison in the outs outskirts of Kabul. And what I learned is that um, it's really tough to be born into a country that has no place for you. So you know, put yourself in the shoes of, of this guy, Abdul Wahid. He grew up in Wardak province just below, um, just below Kabul, son of a government electrician. In fact, there were eight, eight, eight boys. He was one of the younger ones, uh, three sisters as well. And his older brothers basically took every job that was available that his dad could, uh, could help organize. And when he came of age at 18 and ended up on the streets, uh, he moved back home. Um, and after spending several years in Madrasa learning every verse of the Quran uh, in Arabic, um, he doesn't speak Arabic, he speaks Pashto. Um, and so it's, um, his skills, he admits, were limited um, and uh, really couldn't find any meaningful work. Um, and so he joined the Taliban and started ambushing supply lines and living off the spoils. And he tells me that he really loved how he could see it in others' eyes that he was respected when he was carrying his, his rocket-propelled grenade launcher. You know, or put, your, put yourself in the shoes of Mirzadin Totuf Tortufan, one of nine children, uh, not needed on his dad's farm in Helmand. And he didn't have any skills, again, other than memorizing the Quran in Madrasa. And while he was there, he saw a video that you hear a lot about in the, in the prisons there about um, a U.S. troop shooting at the Quran. Um, uh, but it, after you get sort of the first blast of jihadi rhetoric, you know, start asking about him, his circumstances, you realize that joining the Taliban also allowed him to marry. He was able to get, a, uh, get some money from the Taliban and marry. And that's really important. In this sluggish agrarian economy, there's very little legitimate work for young men. And without a job or income, these guys can't marry. Um, sex outside of wedlock is pretty much forbidden. And tradition requires, um, you know, paying a dowry and staging these expensive wedding celebrations. Uh, and as it turns out, that the Taliban tends to pay better than the Afghan National Army, and you don't, and you don't have to leave home. Uh, the ANA likes to send people away into other provinces. So it, it turns out that researchers have found the same thing that I heard, um, interviewing young men in Helmand and Kandahar provinces. In this survey, they were asked. Um, why do you think um, other young men join the Taliban? And the leading reason was jobs and money. Uh, fighting jihad uh, uh, came a close second. And they also asked, um, well, what, would you, what could be done to steer people away from the Taliban? And 82% suggested providing money for dowries and weddings. Uh, Jack Goldstone said something to me um, that really stuck. Um, he's an expert on demography and rebellion from George Mason University. He's been uh, to this, uh, uh, this place several many times. He said in the next couple of decades, there'll be a, a billion people added to what um, he and others call um, the arc of instability. These are these fast-growing, volatile countries that sort of stretch across Africa through the Middle East into Central Asia. And he said, we can't fight the, them. We can't fight a billion people. We have to figure out a better way to help them. I also found there seems to be a correlation between unstable countries and the treatment of women. And Af Afghanistan was voted in a recent international poll of uh, uh, health and gender experts as the most dangerous place to be a woman due to high maternal mortality and gender violence and uh, cultural discrimination. Excuse me, yeah. Um, and so if you look at this issue again through the lens of demographers, um, 
you realize Afghanistan is, uh, is in this, uh, is in quite a fix. That uh, Afghan women have some of the highest birth rates uh, in the world, as high as any of the poorest African nations. They continue to produce more children who have, uh, who have bleak futures with little or nothing to lose. Um, and the population is supposed to double in, s in just a little over 20 years. Uh, Rich Chinkata, who advises uh, defense and intelligence agencies, says he doesn't see any relief in, in sight because it's just simply too hard to um, employ that many people and too easy to recruit them into violence. The last place I want to share with you is we went to the Philippines. Um, it is uh, perhaps one of the fastest, it's one of the fastest growing uh, countries in East Asia. There's 96 million people. It's going to 155 million by, um, by mid-century. Um, and uh, Manila is straining under, the, uh, under, uh, under such growth. There's 12 million people crowded into the metro area. People live in uh, shanty towns, uh, under bridges. The living have taken up um, residence next to the dead in cemeteries and also live on trash dumps, and um, which are uh, smelly, uh, unsanitary. Um, but I have to tell you that the people there actually really like it because they say their incomes are so much better on the trash dumps than they are anywhere else because there's so much ability to sort through the trash for food and for recyclables. Um, the people uh, in uh, the Philippines, 80% are Catholic, but also it's surprisingly in poll after poll, 70% um, of them uh, support something called the Reproductive Health Bill that's uh, now working its way through, um, uh, through, uh, through uh, Congre the Philippine Congress. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, um, it's actually been uh, discussed for about 14 years now, and the church and its supporters have managed to block it uh, all that time. Um, I wanted, we spent a fair bit of time with a couple named uh, Yoli and Noel Nas. Um, and when they were married and in their early years, they, re they knew they only wanted to have three children. But after their third child was born, uh, the mayor of Manila, um, uh, with the blessing of the bishops, uh, basically halted the distribution of contraceptives in public clinics to promote a culture of life. The mayor, uh, mayor's order made birth control pills and contraceptives out of reach for millions of Filipinos, including Yoli and Noel. Um, and they simply just didn't, they just, uh, it was a question for them uh, every month whether they could afford that or they were gonna feed the family. So, um, but let me let Lido Atienza explain himself if I can. Birth control weakens families. Divorce and all of this loss, population control, definitely weakens the family. And anything that weakens the family affects the long-term economic condition of a country. Um, Yoli said the results of this effective ban essentially um, was ugly for her and her husband. And, um, you know, they were struggling to feed their family and couldn't afford birth controls at private clinics. And, and so um, now they live, you know, with their eight children in a 10 by 12 uh, shack, essentially, um, uh, in a shanty town of San Andres uh, in Manila. They eat upstairs and they cook downstairs as well as... Um, uh, take their baths and use the toilet downstairs. Um, and uh, it's a particular problem because they're, they're so low-lying. When the seasonal flooding um, basically buries this um, broken concrete floor under about a foot of water. Uh, Yoli uh, says that her kids are often sick. Um, and when we were there, several of them had measles. Um, and uh, Yoli considers herself a devout Catholic. Um, uh, uh, she goes to Mass, but she chooses to ignore um, uh, her priest who warns how birth control is a sin. Her view is a little bit different. She says that she thinks it's a bigger sin to have a child she cannot properly care for. So when I embarked on this series, um, I approached it as an environmental reporter. Um, you know, what does a growing number uh, uh, of us and growing consumption mean for our planet? what's left uh, of the natural world and everything that nature provides for us. And I ended up being drawn into all these other issues um, and really more concerned at all, uh, than ever for our future. 
Um, I've grown to realize that everything is connected, uh, the environment and development and hunger and poverty and security. Um, and it seems like we've been eager to share our technological advances to improve food supply and save lives, and that's been a terrific thing. But we seem to get squeamish um, in the face of opposition from politicians and religious leaders of sharing our technology uh, to help people plan their families and complete what uh, demographers call the demographic transition um, to uh, long lives and shorter families. And the evidence is, you know, in these USAID-funded uh, surveys that have found that there's uh, more than 220 million women uh, in the developing world who would like to avoid getting pregnant in the next uh, couple of years at least or forever, but do not are not using contraceptives. So what I saw over and over again in our travels is that when these poorest and these least educated women um, have options and not realize they have options to plan their families, that they seize them. And sometimes they do it at the risk of angering their husbands or um, even their mothers-in-law. Um, and I think Bob Engelman, you know, got this right. Uh, I point out that he's a recovering journalist, right? Um, and he, he asked the question, what do women want? And um, his answer is, they don't want more children, they want more for their children. And so the big surprise for me uh, in realizing the key to this issue was really helping poor people, particularly women, realize the potential, uh, giving women the power to make decisions over their lives and their futures and their families. And uh, I never figured that the surfer boy would end up uh, sounding like a born-again feminist. Um, it's, you know, but it, and it's really hard for us to see from our, you know, really wealthy, even luxurious existence here in the U.S. You know, we have equal pay and glass ceiling issues, but there's nothing compared to the plight of the women you see in developing and poor countries. So I, I think the stakes are high, and um, you know, and the suffering is really too great for us to ignore this. Uh, I think we need to have an honest discussion about population, about women's empowerment, and, and their status in these societies, um, and not just bury it and hope that somehow these issues will resolve themselves and somehow go away. So thank you, and I want to thank all my colleagues at the Times for helping me put this together. You want me to play that video? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, th thank you, Jeff, for the uh, for the introduction and the uh, the Wilson Center for organizing this event. Uh, I'm from the, uh, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. We're a nonprofit journalism organization that gives travel grants to journalists who want to do projects on underreported crises around the world. Most of our grantees are freelancers, about 80%, but we also give grants to staffers. Uh, we do about 60 or 70 projects a year. And the work has appeared across a variety of platforms, ranging from the New York Times to uh, PBS NewsHour and uh, the Surfer's Journal, other places. Uh, a, a lot of people hear the word crisis in our name and automatically think conflict. Uh, we're really not about shoot 'em up conflicts, although we do fund some work in war zones. Uh, for us, a crisis is child marriage in, in Yemen and India maternal health in Africa, the strong preference for boy babies in India and China, and the resulting gender imbalance. Uh, we do these stories because, increasingly, traditional media outlets are unable to do them on their own. I spent 18 years as a foreign correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. Up until about five years ago, the Tribune had a dozen foreign bureaus. Today they have zero. Uh, when the Tribune Company uh, bought the Los Angeles Times, Ken's newspaper in 2000, the Times had about 30 foreign bureaus. 
Uh, last time I checked, they had about 15 in theory and 11 in reality. The reason for this is pretty simple. Newspapers aren't making money the way they used to. And posting a full-time correspondent in some place like Tokyo or covering stories on the, the Kenya-Somalia border is not cheap. So the Pulitzer Center, uh, we try to provide the resources to do these stories. We didn't fund uh, Ken's project. We weren't asked, but if we, if we had been, I think the answer would have been a resounding yes. I mean, this is journalism of the highest order. This project manages to bring together about half a dozen of the issues that most concern us. Uh, from the young couple, we meet in the first few paragraphs of the first story, Ramji and Mamta, who married when they were 10 and 11 years old, uh, to the, the so-called youth bulge in Africa and the Middle East, this vast demographic cohort of undereducated, unemployed males uh, whose bleak prospects and frustrations are driving the instability in these regions. These are the kinds of stories that we believe need to be reported. So let me, let me give you a rundown of some of the work that we've uh, supported in the last 18 months. When the Arab Spring was first cranking up in Tunisia, we commissioned Ellen Nickmeyer, a very fine reporter who had worked for the Washington Post in Baghdad and the AP in Cairo, to do a series of stories on the youth bulge across North Africa that was driving events. The story behind the story, her work appeared in Vanity Fair and Foreign Policy. For a project called The Promise of Life, Reproductive Choice in Africa, we recruited four African journalists, one each from Kenya, Nigeria, Liberia, and South Africa, to work with two US journalists uh, to produce a series of reports on maternal health issues. Uh, we thought it important to bring African voices into the discussion. Uh, the reports appeared in Africa media and here in the U.S. We also did a project on the fallout of China's one-child policy and the preference for male babies. That work ran in the, the Atlantic, uh, on public radio in Chicago, and Foreign Policy magazine. A documentary project on gender imbalance in India, uh, where male babies are the preference. Uh, this will be a documentary in German that will air on Der Spiegel television in Germany. Uh, this came about as a result of a grant from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the purpose of seeing if the Pulitzer model can expand in Europe. Uh, we expect that an English version of the documentary will be available for the U.S. market. We've just launched a, a project in Nepal with a journalist and a photojournalist who will examine the practice of chapadi that is banishing girls and women into isolated huts after childbirth or during their menstrual periods uh, because women are considered unclean. Also in collaboration with Harvard University's Neiman Foundation, we sponsor two global health fellows each year. This year, a Times of India journalist is just finishing up a reporting project on healthcare in Brazil, a country that India sees as as a model of a large developing country that's doing a fairly good job of delivering health care services. Uh, the other is currently in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, the place that Ken and Rick document compellingly in their project. Uh, as, as Ken so effectively demonstrates in his project, you have a very serious problem in societies that treat women as property, that deprive them of education, and that force them into childbearing at a very young age. I want to show you a video that we funded that demonstrates all three of these. Uh, I, I should point out that the, the heavy lifting on this project, the photography was supported mainly by uh, National Geographic and, and other grants. We picked it up at the end when we, we saw the work, and we decided that the, uh, making a, a video was a way to bring this thing to a, a much larger audience. And uh, so far, that, that appears to be the case. It's had almost half a million hits on YouTube. So if I can 
Will this do it? During sex, I was crying and begging him to stop, but he didn't listen. Then he put his hand on my mouth like this. I couldn't breathe and I was crying, but he used me anyway. And I just cried. My age is eight. The practice of child marriage is common in many parts of the world. It's not exclusive to any particular religion or society. Despite laws that forbid it, long-held cultural traditions die hard. If the current trend continues, more than 100 million more young girls will be married over the next decade. They were decorating my hands with knives, but I didn't know they were going to marry me off. Then my mother came in and said, come on, my daughter. They were dressing me up and I was asking, where are you taking me? They just said, come, come. And then they performed the wedding. Child marriage occurs in more than 50 developing countries around the world and almost always results in the girls' removal from school. What families don't realize is that by curtailing girls' education, they're only perpetuating the cycle of poverty. Still, families do this for a number of reasons. Perhaps they can't afford to feed the rest of their children. It can create family alliances, and it often settles debts. Early marriage often results in abusive and even deadly consequences. As one Afghan policewoman told me, girls are routinely seen as family burdens, while their male counterparts are seen as kings. She was later murdered by the Taliban. I was seven, eight when I was engaged. My father and his father, they wanted to exchange their children. That time I thought of committing suicide. I was married when I was seven years old. I always say God is punishing me for something. One of the reasons that child marriage continues to prevail is the husband's family and the husband think that when they bring a girl into the family when she's so young, they can mold her to be exactly what they want her to be. And there is this sense that somehow the man is raising this child as his wife. A good wife should be respectful of the groom's family because she's now going to live with them. We don't call a woman beautiful by her looks, but by how nicely she takes care of her house and her husband. He was trying to have sex with me and I was crying and I kept struggling to free myself from him. He mocked me saying, where are you going to go? Then he used me. I was a woman exchanged for someone else's wrongdoing. My father-in-law and my husband, they were all with the Taliban. My father-in-law took me out of the house to a mountain. I thought they would kill me or behead me. I did not think he would cut my nose and my ears. The blood came over my eyes. I didn't know where the blood was coming from.
My friends were not getting married, and it was only me, so I didn't like that. So when I saw my parents preparing the feast, I knew they were definitely going to give me to a husband. So I escaped. I was about 14. The person who gave me a ride, he raped me while we were on our way here. So I was devastated. I regret coming here and I wish I had stayed with my family because the person who raped me didn't use a condom. And he introduced me to a broker who got me this job as a prostitute. After 15 days, I found out I was pregnant. I started getting sick. I struggled as much as I could and worked as a prostitute until I was nine months pregnant. In some cultures, there's this myth that by marrying young virgins, AIDS will be cured. Many times they start having sex immediately because they have no control over their situation. The husband is the one who rules. Older men who have sex with younger girls tend to have sex more frequently. I don't know how children are made, but they get pregnant and they deliver a baby. They carry it inside their stomach. Then they deliver and it comes out a baby. I didn't want to get pregnant because I was very small. I wanted to wait until I am old enough. Is she worried that she won't make it through the birth? Sometimes I think I will die. Was she hopeful for any help? Was she worried about her future? I have never got help from anywhere until now. I don't know anyone who will help me. <laughs> the good news is that rates of child marriage are going down. The problem is we don't want to wait 50 or 100 years for child marriage to disappear. We're talking about 100 million girls who will get married as children over the next decade. We want the change to occur faster. We were studying when my mother was still alive. But then she passed away and they don't allow me to go to school. Education is the single largest protective factor against child marriage. Girls don't want to be child brides. Childhood is not for cooking, cleaning, and having babies. It's for education and having friends and having fun. I pray that we will have better opportunities in the future. I pray that I will be free from HIV when I'm tested. I also pray that the men who were very rude, who beat us, who use knives and guns to threaten us, that we will not have these men in our lives. I pray. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Tom. Um, a lot covered a lot of lot of territory uh, in that, and I, I, we're going to open it up for discussion here in a moment. But um, Ken, in, in some ways, in in 
we heard from Tom on some of the state of affairs in the field of journalism and covering these issues. Um, you didn't tell us about how it, you came to be able to do all this reporting because it's truly, uh, as I understand it, exceptional to have the amount of time, the amount of resources, and the amount of column inches that you got with the series. Um, and we can obviously um, understand how the LA Times would be smart enough to know that um, somebody who's won a Pulitzer Prize is someone you want to give some latitude. But in that sense, can you talk about how you managed to do it and how you see uh, others, you know, your advice for others who want to be covering it from a journalism perspective or for those of us who are working in these areas, what's your advice to us in terms of being most useful in interacting uh, with people trying to tell these stories? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that was, uh, I was, uh, I was told by the editor who actually asked me to do um, another uh, big series that this would be the last chance, essentially, um, for us at the LA Times. Um, he, he, uh, his fellow is uh, David Lauder. He's now our Washington bureau chief, and he uh, is a very strategic fellow. He said that um, uh, the way he see the budget sort of uh, uh, diminishing, that it's either now or never. So we had this discussion. One, um, uh, one November, and he said, uh, you can do anything you want to do, but just start doing it in January, basically, so we could budget it. And I think that's about right. And, and, and Tom's, um, Tom's uh, characterization of the business model is, is absolutely right, that um, you know, newspapers are, um, are quickly uh, losing um, advertising dollars, which is what pays the freight. Um, we're slowly drifting down in circulation. Um, Online advertising dollars don't make up anywhere close to the difference of what we're losing in print advertising. So we're all looking for a different model. And I'm actually very excited about the Pulitzer Center. And there are others that are offering more and more of these sort of uh, uh, stipends, essentially, just to because it's expensive to go out to the field and spend time. Um, um, I'm familiar with um, Stephanie's work. And she spent years and years to, to get into a child marriage. Uh, we tried uh, and failed in India because you have to. It, it, there's a, a cat and mouse game that goes on in India, where, uh, for instance, where um, where they just don't really don't want to show it because it's, it's illegal. Um, and now it happens all the time, um, but um, that just takes time and and thus money and a commitment. To, um, so I think the new model is probably going to be more and more sort of nonprofit groups financing work from journalists that then will go, you know, either they'll be on staff or they'll go looking for a venue for it. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, applaud the pure craftsmanship of this of the, of the piece that you did, and you can see that there were there were dozens of hands involved in it, and it takes a, a great newspaper like the L.A. Times uh, to do a project like that, and more and more it's becoming a a, a, a freelance business where you, where you do things on the fly, and we can fund it. Uh, but the important thing that that we're we're losing, and why it, it's so dismaying to hear that this is the, the Los Angeles Times used to churn out these things fairly regularly, and, and to hear that this this might be the last, which I, I choose not to believe, uh, is is very dismaying. Well, maybe he meant it was the last for me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, uh, Ken, you mentioned a couple times that you came to this as an environmental reporter. Um, how has this series been received by your colleagues in in that realm? How have they plugged into the connections, and with, but with the population at the center connected to environment, connected to security. What kind of feedback from your colleagues? I, I, well, I, um, specifically from environmental uh, colleagues, I mean, it, actually the, the feedback was really surprisingly positive. I mean, I expected, um, I expected uh, more pushback, particularly um, uh, on some of, uh, from, uh, from uh, folks who have, uh, you know, very strong views on these topics, um, but it was quite highbrow, and um, and I think you know, I environmental folks are, you know, I, I mean, the scientists that I deal with, and I mostly, you know, write about science uh, um, issues. I mean, they they all understand. It. They just don't personally want to get engaged in it, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think they were appreciative. So. Terrific. Well, why don't we open it to the floor for some some questions? As I mentioned, because we are webcasting today's event. We ask that you 
use a, a microphone so the folks online can hear your question. Um, and uh, we'll collect a few, perhaps. We'll c come down here in the front, or the mic uh, we're having difficulty with the microphone. Why don't we start with Liz, and then we'll, we'll come over to Brent. Please, Liz. Liz Leahy Madsen with Futures Group. Ken, um, I just want to build off of Jeff's question. Apart from your environmental colleagues, what has been the response to the series, and how, in addition to another Pulitzer, would you judge it to be a success? Um, I think that the re the response is I think is the same. It's um, it it's actually been um, surprisingly highbrow now, um, and 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 er, and thoughtful. Um, you know, I often write about things like climate change, and uh, newspapers have started putting um, comment sections after stories, and you get these raging debates that go on and drift away from the story. And there was some of that, um, particularly in the story in the Philippines, but mostly it was really people being very thoughtful about it. So I, I think it was, I, I was encouraged. Now, I, I'll just say that um, I, I just saw Juliet Altburn, who's an environmental reporter for The Post here, and we were comparing sort of hate missives that we get. And I think I've toughened up over time because you get called so many names. Um, you know, we do, what we do is a very public kind of thing. Um, and, and I expected more of that and I didn't see it. Actually, I think that people were really thoughtful about this and that I found quite encouraging. She asked you, how would you define success for this series? Um, I, I find success that I got it in the paper. I mean, I was really, really <laughs> pleased. <laughs> Um, you know, that uh, it was a long time coming, and I was, uh, to me, it, it was just great to see it out there, and it's going to be on our website, and uh, people are going to it all the time. Um, it, I was very pleased in the end that um, we got an incredible um, display in the paper, and uh, I don't know if any of you actually saw the, the, uh, what appeared in the newspaper, but it was, it was, as we say in the business, a very big ride. I mean, the, the photos and... Um, and uh, graphics were displayed beautifully, and, there were, and the paper really got behind it. And I, I, so to me, it was a success. Thank you. Uh, Ed Berry with the Sustainable World Initiative of the Population Institute. Uh, first, an absolutely huge thank you, Ken, for a tremendous work. It's very rare to see population factor discussed in, in concert with environmental resource needs and that sort of thing, that balancing. So it's, it's fabulous to see it. My question has to do with the political mandate. How can we get this into politics? Uh, and I come from the Rio discourse where there was a tremendous political mandate for economic growth and more development and jobs and, you know, the, the typical stuff. But there was also a very robust um, reality mandate that talked about planetary limits. But, of course, in the end, in the declaration, no mention of planetary limits. And, and when we look at Obama and Romney, we don't hear in that debate anything about <laughs> population issues and environmental sustainability. So my question is, how can we, what, what suggestions might you have to get this into the political discourse? Yeah. <laughs> He's looking at me as the political scientist and that's a, not the role I, for the journalist. I, I, let me just say that my role as a, as a, uh, a reporter, as a journalist, is really uh, what we do best is point out problems. And I think that's what we really focused on in the series. Um, uh, as far as solutions are concerned, uh, political solutions, I'd leave that to, uh, you know, Dr. DeBalco here. Or, or we have, you know, uh, Dr. Scott Radcliffe, uh, that's, uh, you know, the head of the population division, uh, excuse me, the um, population office of USAID. I mean, I, 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 I don't, not sure I have a good answer for this, um, but it's, uh, um, and, and, uh, and if we did, it would be something we probably would run on our editorial pages as opposed to the news pages. But, but is it, it fair to say that th this is also one of the, challenges for telling these stories, it, the, 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 some journalists now are, um, particularly with the, the freelance trends, the, it may make it harder to distinguish between telling the stories and advocating and participating in the advocacy community. Is that a, is that a tension that you face? I mean, it may be more for some of the folks coming to, to you, Tom, but the, the, um, the, the kind of multiple roles that you're expected to play, some of which work with the profession's uh, guidelines and edicts, and some of which 
uh, are really challenging to where, where it has been, let's say. Well, I, th I think that to connect the first question to the second question to answer this one, I think a, a good measure of, of your success and something that we tended to overlook a bit in journalism is the fact that we're, we're having this discussion and that it's, it, it's getting out to different audiences. Too often, you know, we, we, we were happy that, that the thing got a great ride in the paper and then it was done, then it was birdcage liner. Uh, I, really, the work is much more valuable than that, and, and what we, we try to do at the Pulitzer Center is, is to find additional forums to keep the thing alive, to mm -hmm. keep the discussion going. Uh, I, I, the only way to get it into the policy realm is to have these kinds of discussions. Mm -hmm. Professor Link Day, right there. In the middle. Do you, can you give him the other mic so we can? Sorry, Link, your mic's not working for some reason. No, we, we got we got we got that. We appreciate the the compliment for Ken. But we'll let you pose your question so those online can hear it. Well, uh, as you've heard, <laughs> I think it's an outstanding presentation and uh, certainly uh, a very short, succinct presentation. You covered all the bases, including. I think the uh, very important one about growth economics, whether the economists are capitalists or socialists, if they believe in growth, they're not economists in my view because economics tends to, is supposed to, rep uh, to be the uh, study of limits or recognized limits and the economists are just not doing it. They seem to think that every problem can be solved by economics. Um, I'm also impressed by the film about child marriage. I've traveled in some of those countries and it's, uh, it's just an outstanding presentation of a very important problem that we just aren't hearing enough about. So congratulations to both of you. Terrific. Thank you. Actually, Link, if you could just turn around and pass us up maybe right there in the middle. We'll get the, put you to work on the microphone duties there. Right now? Yes, okay. please. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm Anna Federo. I'm an intern in the Senate. Um, I was just wondering, I know you went at it at kind of a more um, environmental angle, as you were saying, but what kind of women's advocacy groups or NGOs or um, nonprofits did you find yourself working with or find yourself um, interacting with? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, what kind of realm of, of actors and groups did you consult for this? I know it's a lot, but... Uh, yeah, right. I think that is the answer. It's a lot. I mean, I just was impressed that Andrew Mahotra, who's somebody who, who um, really helped me in getting around in India, I mean, there was... Um, you know, she's focused on child marriage. Um, we dealt with NGOs all over the place. In fact, it was, um, I had the uh, awkward thing of trying to parachute into a country fairly quickly, find real people to go profile without having any background, not knowing, understanding the language usually, not look, you know, looking very different, I mean, all these issues. And I, I, I'd say that there was sort of, I put them in two groups. There was. USAID, you know, and there are a whole bunch of USAID folk who were very helpful to me here um, because USAID is in all these countries. Um, and the other uh, were, was this network of NGOs, uh, fun, some of them funded by USAID and, uh, and then uh, many other sources as well. And they were my guides, basically. And they were terrific. And I, um, and you pick a country and I'll tell you who it was, but each country it was a different set usually. And they were, but they were, they were invaluable to me. Other, other questions? Dennis? Uh, hi, Ken. Dennis Dimmick from National Geographic. So, so the question would be, um, imagine if there were another series or another big project, and often these stories open doors to new ide to ideas that you hadn't thought were there before. And if you were going to do an another project, what might it be? Oh boy! <laughs> um, um, I'm I'm not sure I really have one in me right now. Uh, quite honestly, uh, this was uh, um, this was it for now. I mean, I'm hoping to write a book off this, um, and uh, 
and that's really what I'm focused on at the moment. So if they're beyond the series, though, if, if there were stories, I mean, so you went out and did this s series, and, and it raised your awareness across the whole pantheon. What mm -hmm. stories need to be done that haven't been done based on? Yeah, where would you drill down further? I see. So I can't help but think that Dennis is looking for, uh, for me to give him my best story ideas. I think that's really <laughs> what's happening here. Uh, so um, Tom, you have any ideas? <laughs> No. <laughs> well, I think, are there, are, were there some countries that you would have liked to have gone to that, 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 because I know we had some of these conversations where you had really compelling reasons to go to different places, and ultimately you had to make some choices, and I'm sure some of those were practical, some of those were timing, but were there other places or other glimpses of, of stories in the same basket that you would have liked to have done or liked to have included or got less left on the floor, so to speak. Oh, yeah, there, w there were many, many, many. Um, you know, I think Nigeria is fascinating, and I, I wish I had had time and, mm -hmm. and uh, to, to go there. Um, and it's going to be hugely important um, to, you know, to, to really the, the whole, you know, not only the continent, but to, to the world. Um, and uh, I mean, there, were, there are other things I would have liked to get gotten more involved in. And, I mean, the child marriage, we did a little bit, but not too much. And uh, human trafficking, uh, you know, I think is really interesting. Um, and it's all really, it, what I was surprised at is how, you know, I had, I had a very narrow view, you know, sort of everything is sort of environmental. And I realize now everything is connected. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, we're as guilty as, of, of this sort of siloed thinking as the funders are and sort of, you know, the money goes to a specific um, you know, program to help us uh, solve a specific problem that when often they're connected and you can't really separate them out. So one leads to another. Mm -hmm. if, if I could follow up on that, I, th I think there's one place that you wanted to go but, uh, but couldn't because reporters generally can't go to report there. But you had a very interesting sidebar on, uh, on fertility in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe you could... Uh, it's a very interesting case right. that run, runs uh, counter to conventional wisdom. Maybe you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, thank, thanks, Tom. That's right. I tried like mad to get into Iran, and we did a little sa sidebar that uh, talked about how um, you know it was Ayatollah Khomeini himself who you know you know issued a fatwa and made family planning universal. Now there's been some efforts by the president uh, Ahmadinejad to roll that back, and a few things. Lately, lowering child, you know, the marriage age and all sorts of things. We'll see if it, mm -hmm. if it um, plays out. But I, I think this is fascinating in in the Muslim context that this is done. It's become universal, and um, and I would have loved to have gone. I really wanted. I tried, and I was. Um, it was interesting because I started working with some demographers um, at the University of um, of Tehran uh, who were going to set me up and get me to go to these. Family plan, they, uh, everybody before marriage, it's a fascinating idea. Before marriage, you have to go to a mandatory family planning class. Can you imagine that happening in the United States? Um, and that's the way it is in Iran. And I really wanted to go sit in on one and, 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 and see it. Um, I couldn't, and we had a stringer there, and I sent him instead. Um, but uh, I, I think it would have been fascinating to go. Um, and I planned to go. And I was just told uh, before uh, Ahmadinejad his re-election, just wait till after the election. Everyone thought he was going to be out. It'll be easier. Well, then all hell broke loose. And um, there are very few journalists who have been allowed in. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we at the center, if, if folks are interested in that case, as well as some of the developments in Afghanistan and comparing it to Pakistan and some of the places that Ken reported on, uh, some of the publications here at the Wilson Center, Environmental Change and Security Program, under the HELPS project um, on new security beat and some standalone articles, including by, by Liz Leahy uh, and Rich Sincata. We urge you to take advantage of those, and um, we'll, we'll connect you to those if, if you're interested. I saw some more hands. Yes, please. Um, I'm uh, uh, Sheila MacDonald from the Population Strategies Group, and I was interested in both the gentlemen talking about how they talk about young women who want to have access to family planning. And I'm interested in what controls their societies that doesn't let them get it. How do you change the old myths? How do you change the old tribal beliefs? How do you change current and past religious beliefs? Like the grandmothers and the mothers that are 
the child brides, like the boys in India where they have to marry early and immediately have children, like the people in Africa who feel that their tribes need more people. How do we change? How do you get in when you have modern medicine and all what sorts of ways to save lives to change the, the beliefs that are there? Were there, were there projects that you thought were being really effective in tackling some of these, these tough projects that you would point to as, as signs of success? Yeah. Um, I, there are lots of efforts to end child marriage, for instance, in India. It's a, there's a big push going on. Um, uh, it, uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think so, there's one that, that's done by Bill Ryerson um, uh, to try to put out these radio uh, dramas, essentially, and, um, and changing societal norms that way so that they have characters and people engage. And, and he says that his programs are, are very effective. He's had, he, he always cites one in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, where he saw a big drive in the number of women who actually sought out family planning afterwards. Um, but th and that's sort of, in a way, modeling after how our cultures have been um, uh, evolved through watching TV and that sort of thing. Um, uh, I, th there seems to be lots of programs out there. It's, it's just the power of tradition is, um, and these cultural and religious imperatives are so powerful. Um, I, you know, we changed over time, um, but it took us a while as well. I, I don't know how this, I don't know, how, I'm not sure I have a good answer how you do this, um, ex ex except that, you know, there are lots of people who are trying. Yeah, all the way in the back, sorry, it's kind of dark, but I can see a hand. Hello, uh, Robert Shredda, international investor. Uh, we've been covering this for about 15 years or so ourselves, and frankly, not knowing that there was a connection between the environment and population increase, I think is something that maybe you should have discovered a little bit earlier. So sorry, but there's a little critique there for you. However, my real question is, do you recognize all the very strong forces that are against you here? Uh, when we ask why these issues aren't being brought up in most societies, including our own, you know, you've got the business groups who are all in favor of more consumption. Their stockholders certainly favor it because they see more profits involved. You've got religious groups who, of course, don't want anyone to touch these issues and don't believe it's anyone's right to even tell them so. Politicians aren't going to go near it because they're told by their economists that anything that suggests economic growth, as we heard you say, GDP growth, is a good thing. No one even questions that basic assumption. So with all of these powerful forces reigning against you, frankly, our, our view on this is that the touchy-feely issue of educating women is not enough. If anybody wants to get serious about this issue, you really have go to come down very boldly, very strongly, by insisting that we withdraw from nations that practice these, these very uh, uh, social norms as, as you put forth in the film. So my real thought is, I think if anybody's going to think about countermeasures here, they've got to come out with stronger stuff than just educating women. Hmm. Well, there'd be a lot of ways to tackle that comment. Uh, um, would you like to, I, I can think of a few, but would you like to? Go for it. Uh, well, I, no, I, I, don't, I don't mean to jump in. I, I think Ken outlined up front that you had a sense of how touchy um, and sensitive this issue was in, in a variety of constituencies. Um, I think you point to a lot of, of trends that make it hard, or exactly what make it hard to do that. I think the challenge becomes the, the um, you know, for example, it could be thrown back at us, those uh, in other parts of the world that see uh, the death penalty as reason to withdraw. So there, there are some challenges in terms of those norms go, uh, it's a two-way street and we have ways that that may be uh, undermining our own case in terms of in terms of engaging, but at the same time, there are obviously very real problems, and um, and so it becomes uh, a, a tremendously challenging uh, thing to do. And um, while we can say the the, the it's 
there's a kind of feel good, you, you, you know, it'd be like being against mom and apple pie to say you're against educating girls. It's not, um, it's not a terribly easy thing to do, uh, and it, it has a lot of uh, indication that can be effective, although, uh, on a lot of these things, although um, very much uh, necessary but not sufficient in terms of tackling these and, and putting uh, issues like population and, and, and reproductive health up front as part of a package. Uh, I guess that's perhaps what I would take from it. Uh, one intervention is not going to be sufficient. It's going to really require uh, um, folks in a lot of different sectors to do that. Scott, would you like to jump in or Melanie? Scott Redball with USAID, and this is in part maybe a response to the question about um, how do you get around the cultural barriers and the, um, um, the social um, pressures that exist. And I think um, in the, at least in the family planning uh, field, we have many countries that uh, uh, where we thought that those were insurmountable um, <coughs> challenges, um, and yet we've made tremendous progress in improving access to um, family planning information and services in um, many of the countries in Latin America, uh, many countries in, uh, in Asia, North Africa. And uh, so in terms of um, the next story, perhaps, uh, you know, could be around uh, countries that have made progress and looking at their experience and um, learning from them. And, and, and actually, to connect that to the Iran uh, example, that some of these things that seem intractable and that it will take centuries for norms to change, uh, the fa right? Am I correct? The fastest drop in fertility and, and really uh, just a matter of a few decades to make a huge difference that really uh, changes the profile of the, the country, let alone just the, um, a, a few a, a few kids or you know a couple an age group really makes a big difference and so can happen very quickly in, in some respects. I'm I'm very curious to see what happens in Iran over time um, because um, you know I talked to a number of experts who who said how there is a there's a real sort of liberation of women that's coming up uh, that's coming up from the fa starting with the family um, and you know it hasn't really realized itself on the streets and in business and in government yet. Um, and now there's, there's some retrenchment on that, but uh, the question that I think is fascinating is, okay, you've given women, uh, you know, the Ayatollah Khomeini and, uh, and the whole government gave women a chance to control uh, you know, their fertility, essentially. Uh, and now, can that be rolled back? Or once women say, you know, I, I'm, you know, uh, we're gonna decide for ourselves how many children to have, and um, you know, will it will it just stay like that forever? I I don't know if there's any going back or not, and I think that's that's going to be a really interesting sort of experiment to see. Mm -hmm. So, final question. I, I think um, perhaps to just oh sorry, I just couldn't see it. No, no. Yeah, um, I'm Ethan Goffman from Sustainability uh, Planning practice and policy. And um, your opening question when the, in, the environmentalists were saying, well, Africa doesn't count. Um, and when I think about it, I think there are all these growing consumer societies and maybe even productive societies. But as far as environmental impact, do you have any kind of conclusions about poverty, the, the poorest populations growing at the huge rate and the environmental impact versus the consumption in other parts of the world? Does that make sense? I think so. I'll take a stab at it. Um, so th th there's this thought that, okay, well, if you have a bunch of poor people, you know, if they're multiplying, what difference does it make? That's what I hear from some environmental, in some environmental quarters. And my point was just that, well, it does matter. It matters to them. It matters to their lives. It matters uh, locally, environmentally. You know, as you saw in Southwest Uganda, where, you know, the effort to save the mountain grill is, uh, you know, that's that's coming up with very steep competition with a fast-growing society of hungry people. And um, so, um, so you know, I think this does matter. Um, it, uh, it's true that the 
proportion of um, you know of uh, CO two emissions per capita of the average African is you know one fraction of what it is for any of us. Um, at the same time, embedded in that philosophy is that the that the sort of expectation that these folks are going to remain poor and almost like oh yeah well they're just going to be poor but I actually would like to see these people have a better life um, you know that they'd get wealthy that they'd be able to have a light bulb you know and that they would you know uh, actually be able to eat better and higher on the food chain and things like that and and so I think that's what sort of bothers me with that uh, sort of narrow thinking of folks concerned about the global uh, environmental aspect as well. We really need to focus on the, you know, the big high consuming nations. That's absolutely true. But uh, these other folks as well, I mean, unless you're going to relegate them to poverty forever, which you know, I don't think any of us really want to do, you know, it, it does matter. It does matter how, how, uh, um, how they, they develop, basically. Very good. Well, I, I neglected to mention those three really important and lovely words that come after some meetings, which is reception to follow. So we have the opportunity to continue this conversation, um, which we'll, I'll invite you all to do over here. But first, want to um, ask you to, to join me in thanking both Tom and Ken for their remarks, and particularly <laughs> Ken. I particularly say Ken is really to be commended, as you've heard from, from all of us, for literally years of work and, and digging on uh, issues that aren't easy to do, uh, even without political opposition to asking the questions, uh, really aren't easy to do and, and tackle. And so we thank you very much for this significant contribution you've made. Please join us across the way. <laughs>